please welcome to the stage ash 2023 local and community engagement committee co-chairs doctors jamaica del mar and jd lopez morning my relatives colleagues and friends my name is jameson lopez i'm from the, from the quichon nation in fort yuma i use he him his pronouns and currently serve as an associate professor at the University of Arizona. I am a brown man with black hair. I live, laugh, love on the traditional homelands of the Tona Atham and Yaqui nations. I share my background with you all today to de demonstrate how relationality to place, space, and other beings is at the core of my being. I entered this work with the local and community engagement committee with these intentions. As co-chairs with Dr. J Jamaica Del Mar, I am humbled to gather here in Minneapolis for ASH 2023 conference. It is important to acknowledge that we are currently on the traditional ancestral homeland of the Dakota and Anishinaabe or Ojibwe, the original inhabitants and stewards of the land and waterways of Minneapolis, Minnesota. The land of the Dakota and Anishinaabe people is now known as Minneapolis-St. Paul metropolitan area was unfairly ceded through major land sessions that coincided with the, co the collapse of the fur trade. We invite you to learn more and join us this afternoon at 3.30 to 5.30. We will host the Why Treaties Matter discussion and reception to explore relationships between Dakota and Ojibwe na Indian nations and the U.S. government in this place we now call Minnesota. Thanks to the Department of Organizational Leadership, Policy and Development, University of Minnesota, Tanya Mitchell, and the Minnesota Humanity Center's Trig Throat for sponsoring this exhibit. Additionally, this afternoon, Thursday, November 16th, 2 to 3.15, we will host an ASH presidential session titled Finding Reconciliation and Reclamation for Indigenous Peoples in Higher Education. Here, a panel of Indigenous scholars will present on reclamation movements and reconciliation efforts between Indigenous communities and university relations. We ask conference attendees to take time to reflect and acknowledge the land and resources we are using to sustain ourselves during the conference. We also ask attendees to devote time to learning about the histories and the experiences of the indigenous people in the Minneapolis area. Welcome to Minneapolis, Minnesota. <laughs> My name is Jamaica Del Mar. I use she, her pronouns. I am an assistant professor of practice at the University of Arizona in Tucson. I'm a person with brown locks and brown skin wearing black pants and a green sweater. I am also a proud Minnesotan born and raised in South Minneapolis. I had the honor of working with a group of dedicated colleagues this year to build on the work of previous colleagues. As the ASH membership gathers on Dakota and Anishinaabe territory, we remind all to consider how scholarship is a means to generate intentional conversations around local and community engagement. This year's conference theme, Purposes, Politics, and Practices, led us to generate contemplative questions to guide this work. Question one, how do we, through our research and practice, recognize and begin to rectify historical and continued harms? And question two, and towards possibility, how do we learn with and give back to the communities of central Minnesota, living rather than simply extolling values of reciprocity and justice? To answer these questions, we were very fortunate to have been joined by a creative and brilliant committee. And we'd like to recognize the following committee members for their contributions. Heather Hagar, Brenda Lee Anderson, Roman Christians, Stevie Lee, Brittany Anderson, Tiffany Smith, Tabitha Cruz, Orkada Mojahari, and Travis Olson. Thank you so much. Part of our task is understanding that the Twin Cities are a space and place 
where indigenous, black, and people of color have been creating community and coalition for a very long time. Pivotal events have taken place within the city, such as it being the birthplace of the American Indian Movement, among many others, all of which we can and should learn more about as a foundation for an understanding contemporary injustices and inequities. Through our collective efforts, we are excited to highlight the work of the LCEC events we were able to bring to the ASH community that include the Minneapolis St. Paul syllabus, official land acknowledgement, why treaties matter exhibit, presidential session, pre-conference session, and collaborating with our colleagues with the ASH Dash podcast and opening grass dance perform, uh, performers. In closing, we hope that you have a wonderful time in Minneapolis and enjoy the 2023 ASH conference. Thank you. Please welcome to the stage, ASH Executive Director, Dr. Jason Gilbo. Good morning. Welcome to ASH 2023. My name is Jason Gilbo. I use he and him pronouns. And I am a white person with a dark beard, brown hair, blue glasses, and I'm wearing a gray suit. I want to first thank Dr. Kyle Hill, who is Ojibwe, Dakota, and Lakota. Dr. Hill and his colleagues joined us right outside of this room, as well as welcomed our newcomers earlier this morning as visitors to uh, Minneapolis. Thank you to Dr. Hill and his colleagues. Five years ago in Portland, I had to do this for the first time as executive director, get up on this stage. Five years later, and a lot has changed in our world and our association. When we were scouting locations for future conferences back in 2019, the home of Prince really stuck out to us. <laughs> but wait. That feels better. <laughs> I want to first take a minute to thank an important group that helps us, helps to make all this possible, our conference sponsors. I want to say thank you to our returning and consistent sponsors, and thank you to our new sponsors who are joining us for the first time this year. Not only do these programs, departments, and organizations financially support ASH, but more importantly, the funds they contribute help us to mitigate passing on additional expenses to you, our conference attendees. Please join me in thanking our conference sponsors. Since our return to an in-person conference in 2021 in San Juan, we have been diligent about COVID mitigation. For this year's conference, we hope you will maintain the same level of caution as previous year. Face mask and hand sanitizer are provided for all attendees near check-in, and we've worked to maintain some social distancing and seats throughout the conference, uh, which is just nice as well to not be on top of each other. Uh, we also ask that you recognize when folks may want more social distance, distancing, as indicated by either a red or darker color ribbon or a yellow lighter color ribbon. As a reminder as well, since 2020, we have implemented our events code of conduct, and since 2022, we have implemented our revised ethics policies. These policies are not in place as restrictions on our activities necessarily, but in order to facilitate an inclusive and meaningful community. They call on us to enter this space together. We hope we will not have to call upon these policies, but they are here if, and even perhaps, when we do. Ash has contracted with Mary Conger and Colette Carmouche to support our, all of our conference attendees. The role of our conference ombuds is to support attendees with interpersonal issues, resource identification, and more. Mary and Colette are available by walk-in or appointment. 
please check the conference app for more information. As we continue our time together, I also want to say I'm grateful for each of you that are in this room today. Yesterday, we kicked off this week's events with pre-conferences and the welcome reception. This morning, we welcomed our first time attendees. We also have some VIP seating for our newcomers over here, and we have much more in store for the next few days. Prior to this year, the work of the conference was really coordinated between the president, the program committee chairs, and the staff. This model worked for us for many, many years. But as the association continues to grow, we continue to explore our organizational structure. I am grateful for my good friend, Dr. Leslie Gonzalez, who has served as our inaugural conference committee chair. Leslie was actually program committee chair during my first year as executive director back in 2019. Leslie, you have been a tremendous leader and partner in this work. And to the conference committee leadership team, thank you for leading the way. Each of you and your committees have made the association a better association and me a better person. Thank you. Can I wear this all day? Please welcome to the stage, Ash 2023 Conference Committee Chair, Dr. Leslie Gonzalez. Really getting my steps in this morning. Wow, that's a, that's a long walk. Good morning, everyone. Thank you all for being here. My name is Leslie Gonzalez. I go by she, her, ella pronouns. I am a short woman, although you couldn't tell, <laughs> with long, dark brown hair, brown eyes, and medium colored skin. I'm wearing a dark green dress. I acknowledge and pay my respects to the original caretakers, the Dakota people of the land on which we are currently situated. I'm coming to you today from the state of Michigan, where I'm a professor at Michigan State University which occupies the ancestral, traditional, and contemporary lands of the Anishinaabeg peoples. <clears throat> Excuse me. To begin, I ask that we all pause. My good friend and colleague, Dr. Julia Carpeet, recently taught me the importance of pausing. So please take a second to just look around and take in this amazing moment. A few years ago, I had a hard time imagining that our community might ever have the chance to come together face to face again. And while it is true that this is our second in-person ash since the height of the pandemic, my joy and gratitude remain robust as they were when we first reconvened in Puerto Rico in 2021 under the leadership of then ash president, Dr. D.L. Stewart. That once a year, I can be reunited with new and old colleagues and friends. I refuse to take that for granted. Without our relationships, what do we have? Still, I am mindful that in-person events pose a danger to many of our colleagues, particularly those who are disabled and for whom travel remains far too great a threat. So I ask us to please take in the beauty of our togetherness and also hold space for, for colleagues who cannot be here with us in person. And while we are centering the importance of community and relationships, I also ask that we take a moment to recognize that perhaps in different ways, many of us are entering the conference space with heaviness and grief in our hearts. My love and my heart Go out to any and all seeking to move through these next few days with curiosity and joy, even while carrying sadness in your heart. Without reservation, my love goes out to the Palestinian and Jewish members of our community who are closely affected by the ongoing violence. If you have not yet done so, please contact your congressional members and ask for a ceasefire ask that humanitarian aid is provided to the Gazan people. Your calls and your emails, they matter, and it will take less than a minute to do so. Let us all pause, hold space, 
and throw our collective energy towards the liberation of all people here and across the world. As Jason shared in 2019, I had the pleasure of serving as ASH program chair. Um, in that role, I worked with an amazing program committee to build on and extend the work of former program committees. In 2019, we produced what I think was a really wonderful, welcoming ASH experience in Portland. At the end of the conference, I got on a stage like this. I said thanks, goodbye, and I thought I checked ASH service off my list for a while. But here I am. Last fall, Dr. Martinez Aleman called me up to ask me if I would be willing to lead ASH's inaugural conference committee. I want to talk with you a little bit about what we've been doing as the ASH conference committee because it's a new structure and it's an opportunity to share with you opportunities for you to be engaged and to have leadership development in the association. The task of this new committee, I learned, was to attend to these five areas that you see on the slide. Accessibility, attendee engagement, local community engagement, wellness, and of course, the program committee, the academic program. Largely, our task was to bring folks together whose scholarly and personal wisdom would allow them to speak on these various areas in order to craft a thoroughly inclusive and welcoming conference experience inside and perhaps even more so beyond the academic program. So over the last year or so, I have had the distinct honor to learn from and work with this wonderful group of people here. I don't know where the slide is anymore. <laughs> Bear with me, I haven't had my coffee. I have had the distinct honor to work from and to learn from and work with this wonderful group of people who in turn co-led small work groups to create programming and ideas in support of their various charges. I ask that we pause and recognize the labor, the very important labor that makes our association and our conference experience come alive. These folks have poured into ASH, but more importantly, they are pouring into you and to your experience over the last 12 months. In general, once a month, the entire Conference Accessibility Committee, we'd come together to pitch ideas and share feedback and capitalize on opportunities to collaborate. At the forefront of our minds and hearts were all of you. How could we serve you? How could we make sure that you not only experienced ASH as a fun learning space, but as a safe, inclusive one? I want to talk with you about some of the very specific things that we've created and that hopefully you will enjoy from over the next few days. I'll begin with the Accessibility Committee. Our Accessibility Committee was led by Drs. Julia Carpeach, Kat Stevens-Peace, Emily Coren, and Daniel Blake. These folks share their collective energy and wisdom, nudging all of us on the CCLT to think more deeply and act more consistently around disability injustice and accessibility. Ever so generously, they read and reviewed the unstatement for our committee. The unstatement is a guide which largely started inside of CEP, created by disabled scholars, scholars of color, and comrades last year. This unstatement, which you can scan with this QR code, teaches urges all of us to enter ASH and indeed all spaces with the solidarity politic. To consider how our practices and our orientations might be revised to create an ASH that is welcoming to all. The LCEC group, we've heard uh, just recently from Drs. Jamaica Del Mar and Dr. J.D. Lopez. This group built on the work of prior LCECs and developed a resource-rich syllabus that foregrounds indigenous thought and leadership and sheds light on cross-race, cross-ethnic coalition organizing that Minneapolis is known for. A very big special thanks to the syllabus team, which was largely led by Tabitha Cruz, a graduate student at University of Minnesota. Thank you for your vision. I 
I want to also say thank you to Dr. Orkada Mohajeri for gathering indigenous created podcasts that you can listen to in order to learn more about the Minneapolis St. Paul area. We're encouraging you to do so during the Ash Dash on Saturday. On to the Wellness Committee. The Wellness Group was co led by Dr. Liza Talusan and Amy Collinsworth. They have taken beloved traditions like Yoga Ash and the Ash Dash and redesign them to be radically inclusive. For example, Yoga Ash will be led by a body inclusive instructor who has experience in chair yoga and other helpful accommodations. The Wellness Committee redesign, has designed other thoughtful spaces that account for your holistic well-being, a low sensory room and a prayer and a reflection room. They have also created a session in collaboration with Dr. Chinasa Elu, who will speak on what it means to live with and learn to thrive in the context of academia while honoring your grief. All important work. Working with the accessibility group, who reminded us of the heavy cognitive tax that text-heavy signs demand, the wellness team also designed small icons to indicate when and where a wellness center activity is available to you. Just look for this heart icon around the conference. And on to attendee engagement. Doctors Judy Kiyama and Layla McLeod led attendee engagement. And like any conference and association, the purpose of attendee engagement is to help people figure out how to navigate this space. For newcomers and senior colleagues alike, Doctors Kiyama and McLeod hosted Welcome Wednesday webinars intended to help first time or returning attendees figure out some of the ASH basics, but they also designed special events, including the kickoff event that many of us enjoyed last night, the newcomer event this morning, and the celebratory promotion event that will be held later this afternoon. From earbuds to soften the buzz of an otherwise very busy hotel setting, to a local restaurant and cafe guide that documents accessibility and, inclu and gender inclusive information. Special shout out to PhD candidate Nasi Bangal for your meticulous work on this resource guide. The conference committee leadership team has worked tirelessly over the last year to identify opportunities to enhance inclusion, to create more useful materials, and to ensure that each of you feels welcome and validated. Perhaps some in the audience think this is all too much for a scholarly association. Perhaps others see that it is not enough. Either way, I am very proud to be a part of an organization that is willing to try and that recognizes the importance of building safer, more inclusive, and more welcoming spaces. I want to, of course, also thank the program committee chaired by Drs. Angelo Boatman and Gerardo Blanco for building a robust, scholarly program that will benefit, stimulate, and inspire all of us over the next few days. Although you had your own distinct charge, you were always willing to attend the conference committee meeting to ensure that we stayed on the same page and to identify synergy when possible. You have designed so many exciting sessions intended to help our ASH community think about the purposes, politics, and practices of higher education research. Thank you to the ASH staff Alicia, Aaron, Briante, Naomi, and of course, Jason, my very good forever friend. Thank you for supporting the work of CCLT. Thank you to the ASH board for envisioning the conference committee and recognize the importance of creating spaces beyond the academic program that honor accessibility, inclusion, and wellness. And finally, thank you deeply from the bottom of my heart to the conference committee leadership team for teaching me so much this year and for showing up in such important ways. Your labor is deeply appreciated. Can we please sing? And now, it is my tremendous honor to introduce my mentor, my dear friend, and our ASH president, Dr. Ana Martinez Aleman. As I prepared these comments to introduce Anna, I kept asking, what does one say to introduce someone whose ideas, whose life's work has inspired your own, whose mentorship and good counsel have guided you in some of your most pressing moments, 
and whose humor genuinely makes you laugh out loud. As her faculty colleagues at Boston College attest, Anna always has a joke at the ready, and is, if there is a funny meme out there, she has probably already seen it or maybe created it. And just as I felt like I couldn't come up with the words to introduce Anna, I reflected on how I came to know of her. In 1997 and 2000, Anna published two papers. One broadly addressed the educative value of women's collegiate friendships, and the other addressed, more specifically, how women of color drew upon friendship as a site of learning and for coming to know themselves, for testing out ideas and developing a fuller, richer, richer intellectual sense of self. At this point in time, scholars publishing in mainstream journals rarely acknowledged how we build knowledge before and beyond the classroom. And it was quite rare to see someone focusing on women's friendship, acknowledging it as generative fuel for women's intellectual work. Anna's creative work anchored in ideas that feminists, and especially feminists of color, have long articulated, provided the material for understanding what I had been learning from other faculty in my own scholarship, especially women of color that much of our intellectual work is derived from spaces beyond the classroom, including these relationships that allow for authenticity, vulnerability, truth-telling, and a kind of softness that is not always typically associated with academic spaces. For your beautiful qualitative work, your attention to gender and race and friendship, at times that these topics were not often studied, thank you, Anna. Your ideas led me to the work of other women of color scholars Marianne Ortega, Patricia Hill Collins, Anna Castillo, Bell Hooks, Sharon Fries Betts, Bridget, Bridget Kelly. These are the ideas for world making that I was looking for and that I still use today, and for that I am deeply thankful. Please, everyone, a celebration for our Ash President, Ana Martinez Aleman. Anna is a professor of higher education and associate dean for faculty and administrative affairs at Boston College. And while it is true that Anna has published dozens of articles, several chapters, and books, that her work covers an array of important topics, that each work shows her careful philosophical skills and theoretical thinking, Anna finds the greatest joy, as she recently shared with me, in teaching and working with her students. A quick review of her CV shows many collaborations with colleagues earlier career than her, and often with students. Students and colleagues who shared with me, she is the most excellent kind of mentor. Someone whose encouragement and pr profound belief in others' potential is so unparalleled, she can help you reimagine your potential. Someone who foolheartedly and deeply celebrates your successes and reminds you to do the same. So here is to you, Anna. Thank you for being a wonderful mentor, an inspiring researcher, a joyful teacher, and for sharing your gifts with the association. Ha sido un placer. Um, so yeah, I have few skills. And um, one of them is trying to get my iPad going. Because if not, the talk is going to be really problematic. Um, but um, what I do want to say is that one skill, I have two things to say. One is that one skill that I know I do have is recognizing really smart, good-natured, and incredibly conscientious people that make me look good. <laughs> uh, and that would be Leslie. <laughs> um, and everything she said about um, how, you know, how I care for my students and blah, blah. Um, <laughs> there are many of my students here today that it's wrong. Um, some of my former students will tell you that I'm mean. Um, <laughs> please hold on to that. Um, I, I have a reputation at, at, at state. Well, maybe not, I don't know. But um, so first and foremost, um, thanks for getting up early. I know for some of you, um, I, it will be something that you will forever remind me of. Um, 
And I do want to say that um, it's, uh, it's been great getting to know a lot of new people here. I think one of the things that we forget about Ash is that um, you really do get a chance to meet people um, you know, in different generations of research and in different places and in new programs. Um, and that's just been, in, it always is very, very much my favorite part of ASH. Uh, and I do hope that it, um, you're also experiencing that as well. But let me get on with it, um, and because they, they put this little interesting clock down there that is very, you know. Um, so, uh, <laughs> So I hope that you've read the poem. I was badgering people as they came in because if you haven't read the poem that you're probably sitting on, um, this talk will make absolutely no sense. So you've read the poem? Okay. By the way, I did try to shame the people in the back to move up, but clearly I was not. Um... Okay, so you've read the poem. So let's, so class will begin. So close your eyes. Close your eyes, people. Okay. Can you see yourself in your front yard? Walk through the treasured geography of its fixed but tolerable certitude. Recall the feeling of its baffling inevitability. What do you see there? What's familiar, known, comfortable, safe? Maybe you've seen or can remember seeing uninterrupted miles of farmland or distant mountains or desert prairie or coastal creeks and ocean inlets that roused your imagination beyond your earthly horizon. Or perhaps you see miles of adjoining unnaturally green suburban lawns or city stoops and streets of tracked Lego brick buildings conjoined by the cruel geometry of urban planning or a sliver of soil where mango trees grew, their canopies stretching from yard to yard, shamelessly insisting that you climb higher and higher. The certainty of our front yard with its benign contours and perimeter had its limitations, its imposing truthless horizon. Each of us could name its confines and paradoxically were reassured by its comforting certainty. In the front yard, play and posture were predictable because we were watched over by one adult or another, or at least believed that we were. In the front yard, adults' real or fabricated surveillance cramped our style, frustrated our independence, thwarted our desire to utter a recently heard expletive. And I bet that we can all recall what it was like to be sick of a rose, as Gwendolyn Brooks would say. Like Brooks, we can all remember what it was like like to escape the front yard to the back and maybe go down the alley, maybe driven by some need for self-determination. Leaving the front yard to take a peek at the back freed us to be inventive, resourceful, creative. But now recall the backyard. Some of you can see a neighbor's unsanctioned, rickety, above-ground pool filled with sticky, sweaty kids. And even today, you still long for an invitation to join them, despite your mother's cautionary disapproval. Some of you can remember a backyard where the forest was demarcated and blackened by a mysterious tree line. You can still hear adults warning you about the chupacabra that lurked within. Chupacabra's real, niña. Quédate aquí. They'd admonish you. But still, you'd take the chance, venturing deeper and deeper into the woods all the while giggling nervously at the chance that you'd encounter the blood-sucking beast, all the while savoring the fact that such a risk was liberating, that there was freedom in taking a chance and experiencing the unfamiliar. Some of us can recall backyards of uninterrupted lines of freshly washed laundry that stretched from apartment window to apartment window, yielding no opening for untamed city street games, but providing a chance to experience the unsanctioned fun that waited in the back alley. So last November, I asked us to peek at the back, where it's rough and untended and the hungry weed, weed grows, where it's untried, where perhaps there's trouble, but imaginable, exciting fun. I asked us to break through the boredom and confinement of the research and scholarship that compose our professional front yard 
and to embrace the untended backyard. So let's use the poem by Gwendolyn Brooks has given us as a literary device to help us think about the relevance of higher education research in light of its various purposes, the politics that inform those purposes, and the practices they endanger. Let's think about the front yard as the predictable, predetermined, and settled geography of higher education, scholarship, its research, and the roses as the knowledge that has been carefully cultivated and sheltered and surveilled. Let's ask ourselves, have we forgotten that the geography of higher education research extends to and can flourish beyond the front yard? Is it time to look beyond the predetermined and fixed scholarly geography of the front yard? Is it time to risk the chupacabra? Like physical geographies, scholarly geography can't be detached from its location. In the physical world, for example, we can all see how evolutionary evolutionary topographies have been contributory factors to the fate of colonized peoples. By way of illustration, in historian Ada Ferrer's Cuba and American history, we come to see how Cuba's social, political, and cultural geography, the presumption of autonomy, centuries-old resentment of colonization by Europeans and eventually European Americans, just can't be separated from its physical location. Bound to its latitudinal and longitudinal verity, its colonial destiny was lamentably unavoidable. Like all of the islands of the Caribbean, Martinique, Barbados, Bahamas, Española, Jamaica, Puerto Rico, just to name a few, Cuba's geography has determined its frame of reference, its posture, its standpoint, its front yard, if you will. Has what we research and the ways that we do our research become an exercise in predictable scholarly geography? Are we positioned in an invariable and knowable front yard geography? Are we bound to our scholarly geography's latitude and longitude? Is higher education research, like the colonized islands of the Caribbean, stuck in the geography of predictable front yard viewpoints? As social scientists, the experiential worlds that we study are ever-changing and, and capricious. Unlike Cuba's unchanging geography, we should not accept that our scholarly geography is an unchanging topography. So maybe can a peek at the geography of the backyard serve to expand and elaborate purposeful research and scholarship in higher education? What boundaries have we unknowingly or, or willfully placed on our work to limit its geography to the front yard? Can a view of the geographies of the backyard all its risks and possibilities. Open our work to epistemic schemes and a happy unsettling of our existential prerogatives. Should we chance going down the alley? Should we risk an encounter with the chupacabra? I think so. But how do you do it, right? How do we move beyond the predictable and undemanding geography of our research and scholarship? I want to suggest three ways. First, we ought to recover the uncomplicated properties of our innocence, our childhood longing to move beyond the regulated geography of the front yard so that we can enlist the imaginative to create prescient research. As researchers and scholars, imagination is still very much accessible to us. Our inquiries can be steered by imaginative vision, one that engages association and connection beyond our immediate and current command. Like Gwendolyn Brooks, as children, we allowed ourselves to peek at the dangers and possibilities of what lay beyond the backyard and the alley. What excitement could be possible beyond the cautionary limits imposed by experienced, well-meaning adults? As children, we intuitively yearned for the freedom to experience without limits while simultaneously believing in the comfort and safety of the particular geographies that adults had scripted for us. Chupacabra is real, niña, quédate aquí. But in the creative act, A Way of Being, Rick Rubin reminds us that as illustrators and animators of the circumstances and fictions of life, in our case, a geography of higher education, the temper of childhood is not lost to us as adults. Despite whatever perimeters now circumscribe our scholarly geography, 
The childlike qualities that Brooks' poem evokes are vital to the creative beings that we are. In the creation of social science, this spirit of curiosity feeds the researcher's hunt for the missing pieces of the puzzles of experience. Think about what your own childhood memories arouse. You receive new information with delight instead of making comparisons to what you already believed or what you were told to believe. In childhood, we were curious, not jaded. At its most fundamental, our thinking in childhood could not escape uncertainty and relied on new experiences and interactions. As children, our imagination wasn't mechanical. It was rarely efficient and often adventurous and experimental. Imagination animated our observations, our actions, experiences. We engaged in what Dewey would call the conscious adjustment of new experiences. There really isn't the chupacabra in the woods. And the old experiences, the chupacabra is real, niña, believe me. As adults, we surrender to the habituation of our thinking, disremembering that some degree of imaginative quality is concealed by experiential schema that we've adopted and likely adapted. Because our thinking and consciousness as, an adult, as adults is set through habituation, we often lose sight of the fact that uncertainty, risk, and doubt, all elements of reconsiderations and modifications that we make to knowledge are the playground of imagination and wonder. As in all play, experiential uncertainty and unpredictability enable our imaginative schemes, most often without the restrictions of efficiency and demand for tangible production. Through play, we have opportunities for interaction, association, communication, collaboration, and these serve as imaginative roads to meaning and knowledge. In fact, controlling experiences and limiting connections with others stunts our creativity. In other words, the play of imagination enriches the geography of knowledge because it doesn't limit our interactions with new understandings located beyond our ken. Consequently, if we were to enlist our imagination so it can serve as the means to enrich and broaden the substance and the scope of our scholarly knowledge claims, it means, in part, that we have to play with others, maybe even in their front yards, where we can see beyond the borders of our well-tended scholarly geography. So secondly, I want to suggest that one way to move beyond our predictable geographies of research and scholarship is to go into the neighbor's front yard and consider what you see there, ponder what your neighbor is able to see, perhaps borrow her tools, perhaps ask her to play. We should take the risk to deliberate on what their scholarly geographies can offer our suppositions and take a chance at catching a view we've never imagined and never expected is worth seeing. So here are two examples of what I mean. First, post-colonial scholars have summoned us consistently over the years uh, to leave behind our well-manicured front yard and peek into theirs where among many things, we can see how the history and context of empire, not the show, empire, well, how the history and context of empire continues to dictate and cultivate our social theories. And that in doing that, we then use those social theories ruled by this construct to guide our social science inquiries. From the post-colonialist backyard, we can see that the logic of empire used to create our scholar geographies today is a moth-eaten, misleading map for us social science researchers. If we really, really, really want to truly understand global realities. Sociologists also say, hey, look, um, let, let us counsel you uh, as other social science researchers like us to take a look in their backyard with the changes in the contemporary social landscape brought about by the information new media age are quite apparent. They urge researchers to look at the new opportunities to observe behavior, ask questions, run experiments that new media age technologies afford. 
most importantly, these technologies enable researchers to collaborate in ways that were simply impossible just in the recent past. These are just two invitations to move out of the front yard. And they really do serve as an appeal to get us out of our front yard stifling and tired view. Bringing it home, for a few years now, I've been thinking about my own front yard. I've been surveying the topography of my scholarship, scrutinizing its safety, its smallness. At times, I have mused that I was just unwillingly trapped in a fast-moving whirlpool of age-related existential occupational terror. <laughs> uh, that the tint of my well-tended roses out front are now muted. Their purpose is growing faint. I've begun to ask myself questions about, <clears throat> excuse me, my own scholarly geography, how my existing mental maps now depict the expected and have become tired frames of now hegemonic constructions. In my own work on college students' um, interactions with social media, for example, my front yard now likely limits my view of contemporary reasoning about social relationships, likely because my view is fenced in by a somewhat dated understanding of being, of living in the world. The logic of today's social media communication extends beyond what was conceivable to my social scientific thinking in the early 20th century. Social media research now and into the foreseeable future will demand that I leave the front yard to see, at a minimum, that social relations in the digital age are not simply confined to online platforms and what those online platforms um, and those online relationships, how they affect online behavior. Web technology's ubiquity affects all aspects of college students' social relationships, certainly. But I imagine that understanding how current and future generations of college students embodied social relations and their behaviors are universally impacted by, informed by, and altered by these media I have to consider how social media's penetration into their generational understanding and construction of self, self-actualization, self-efficiency, being in the world. That's the core here. And in a sense, the self, who I am everywhere, is technology-mediated being. On our campuses today, we have generations who conceptualize social media as a natural and not an artificial part of being in the world. That being social, whether online, offline, is just living. Today, being social or alone seems unbounded by the obsolete distinctions of what constitutes being online and offline, my front yard. I now wonder how students' perceptions of self who they are, who they are with others, operationalized manifestations of self beyond what I already know of as online impression management. And those conscious processes of, of online self-presentations that you've researched to death. So some months ago, I began to wonder who else was curious about this. A peek into my neighbor's front yard, a computational social scientist confirmed that when I now conceptualize inquiries on college students and social media, I need to reframe these technologies as more than simply mediating self just online. Rather, the logic of these technologies today and the fact that they now exist everywhere in everything we do enlarges the conceptualization of social media relations as factually informing and cultivating everything social, visible, and invisible, everything about self that is visible as well as that which is hidden from view. I have been tending to my front yard's conceptualization of online social relations as only visible manifestations of their effects on visible behavior. Indeed, the invisible internalizations of online relations can now be conceptualized as existing everywhere, internal and external realities that lay beyond what I had been able to see in my well-tended front yard. 
our college student relations, those with faculty, staff, peers, family, subliminally, subliminally mediated by today's digital technologies. I feel the need to go snooping in my psychologist neighbor's front yard. Eeks! <laughs> Look, many of our colleagues are snoops. They make it a practice of snooping on their scholarly neighbors. Scholarly snooping and neighborly nosiness are conventional exercises for many of our higher education colleagues, and we should follow their example. They routinely look to other scholarly front yards and their geographies to better understand higher education. They peek down the alley to see what fun can be had beyond the back. If you don't like to snoop, or you say you don't, but actually do. <laughs> Just think of it as borrowing from social science neighbors. Jelena Brankovic and Brendan Cantwell have reminded us that accessing concepts, theories, methods from scholarly neighbors is an epistemic and pragmatic trait that distinguishes higher education scholarly geography. It is something that we are meant to do as a scholarly field. They remind us that higher education is a social science field characterized by the dual purposes of generating new academic knowledge and practical information. Consequently, when we want to deepen our knowledge of, say, institutional change, institutional management, system governance, as Cantwell and Brankovic do, a peek into the neighbor's yard, whether the economists, the historians, the philosophers, is what we're supposed to do, what we're destined to do. This is a daring, creative, and imaginative act impossible to sticking to our well-tended front yard. Nosy bodies, Leslie Gonzalez, and Penny Pasque. Come on, Photoshop. Photoshop is awesome. Uh, so Nosy Bodies, Leslie Gonzalez, and Penny Pasque snuck a look-see into the scholarship of British moral philosopher Miranda Fricker and African-American feminist philosopher Christy Dotson to chart epistemic terrain of doctoral education, bring to higher education philosophers distinctive ways to recognize no validation in multidisciplinary graduate programs. Natasha Kroom, Krista Porter, Sandy Soule left their front yard and saw how black feminist explanations contest the epistemic nature and limits of higher education research. Stephanie Wartman's geopoetic documentation of indigenous knowledge systems jolted our colonial myopia, blowing up even the poetic illusion of bounded epistemological geography. Simon Martinson and Brian Pusser habitually peeked next door to scope out neighborly scenes drawn by political science, social philosophy, to construct useful models of how power circulates to move post-secondary behavior worldwide. And I would bet that our Ash colleague, and my Cubanico madre, Amalia Dache, poked around her neighbor's yard and saw how to better understand college access for urban, low-income, racial, and ethnic populations, the bus riders from Barrio to college, through spatio-temporality, a tool borrowed from technical geographers next door. Amalia didn't pay attention to disciplinary fences, like all us Cubans, by the way. Uh, she didn't subscribe to Robert Frost's Anglo-Protestant you know, principle that fences make good neighbors quite the opposite, actually, and Ash should embrace it. Our academic neighbors have distinctive scholarly geography that we should not neglect to regard. The scholarly views from our academic neighbors' front yards can absolutely help us advance our contributions to knowledge, to policy, and to practices. But making use of our scholarly neighbors' front yard views is not enough. After all, they suffer from a limited geography just as we do. Maybe we should risk the fun of the alley together. Together in the alley, maybe we should see the wonderful things that can be done to better higher education. What I'm suggesting here is social scientists should collaborate in the alleys of each of our well-tended scholarly geographies, despite how idealistic and unwarranted this may seem to some of us. After all, we have tended 
two roses that serve as evidence or truths to inform equitable educational policy. Why risk the inevitable tensions and dangers of interdisciplinary collaborations there in the alley? Why risk reimagining and redefining a problem firm, firmly anchored to our secure scholarly geography? So my third suggestion is to stop playing it safe and venture into the alley and to risk interdisciplinary collaboration. I'm not alone in believing in this power of interdisciplinary collaboration among social scientists. Recently, for example, a team of Caltech behavioral scientists posited in this golden age of social science, an age characterized by the explosion of new data resources and, and research technologies, we have the analytical and computational power to better understand the more challenging problems facing the world today. Arguing that the social scientists now need a lingua franca, a functional bridge language, to enable scholarly teams to tackle multidimensional problems and create innovations to better social spaces, they cautioned that we can only really achieve a fuller understanding of our intersectional social realities by doing more than just borrowing each other's frameworks and tools. They reason that by working as interdisciplinary teams of collaborative researchers, more robust explanations and solutions for, the, for, the social, pro, for social problems can ensue. The essence of their argument is that in order for us to better social science, the social science of higher education, we need to team up with our scholarly neighbors. Though this team of behavioral scientists acknowledges that the history of social science has drafted a geography of siloed journals, different conventions for authorship, and disconnected frameworks, they're a hopeful team of scholars. They appreciate that examining social relations and social institutions for the purposes of improving these institutions can best serve individuals and groups, demands reconciling systems of disciplinary knowledge a reconciliation that includes multidimensional and many-sided approaches to theorizing, methodological inquiry, and analysis. They point to the recent growth of team-based cross-disciplinary research found in scholarly journals as a hopeful sign that social scientists can indeed play together in the alley. That song in the front yard that we higher education researchers sing today is one of predictability and safety. And we are at a time that calls for some other tunes to be sung. The turmoil and instability that we experience today in higher education, legislative and political stifling of government's proven levers of equity, the public's waning trust of our purposes, and our now long-term and contentious marriage to market-oriented policies, though not all new, and higher education historians like to remind us of this, and good for them, this requires that we move beyond what has confined us to the front yard. All of our curiosity about how and what our sky neighbors see, all the scrutinizing of what is beyond our front yard, the wonderful fun in the alleys beyond the view, embodies our purpose as higher education scholars and researchers. As higher education researchers, we bear a responsibility to tend to the front yard, to tend to what we know how to do and what we have established as reasonable. But a measure of our purpose is to walk beyond the front yard to the rough and tended weeds, untended weeds, to the alleyways where other children play, where we can imagine and create some wonderful things. Past ASH presidents have urged us to do this very thing. In one way or another, each ASH president before me has asked us to employ imagination and creativity to reimagine higher education and higher education research in light of its purposes, and they were right to do so. I'm asking us to do the same thing by taking a moment to reflect on our scholarly geography and to look beyond the near horizon of what we expect and what we already know will materialize. As a social science community, we need to re-engage our imagination and exercise scholarly nosiness to discern what can be learned from and with our scholarly neighbors, what inquiry-worthy vistas can be seen beyond the geography of our front yards. 
positive psychologist would say that what I'm asking us to do is the ikigai of social science research, an exercise to gain better awareness of our purposes, an exercise in which we can identify professional purposes by reflecting on what higher education needs us to do at this moment. And I just don't think that we can really do that myopically. That is, solely staying in a well-tended front yard, delimited by its unchanging and tired geography. As our Friday keynote speaker, Marcelo Suarez Orozco, the chancellor of UMass Boston, will remind us, our institutions globally were not built for the present day, at this moment, waves of immigrants and first generation students. Can we really address this historical moment by only peeking at our higher education colleagues' front yards by simply sticking to the insularity of our indistinguishable and safe front yards? As higher education scholars and researchers, our purposes certainly aren't singular, except to say that we are all ultimately motivated, motivated by a desire to contribute our collective knowledge to better higher education and to direct knowledge to blow the whistle on inequitable and inhumane politics and practices. As social scientists, we believe that knowledge might actually improve the human experience, in our case, higher education. And in fact, as historians can attest, in the past we have actualized and capitalized on that confidence and have changed the purposes, practices, and politics of higher education. We're a hopeful and brave bunch who have heard presidential calls to direct our research to inform equitable policies and practices. Our Saturday, our Saturday plenary session on redesigning democracy to better serve higher education is just one concrete example of how ASH scholars and practitioners enact their aspirational agenda to improve our institutions. For me, growing up in ASH's front yard, I've believed in that optimism and in those purposes. I have learned from a community of colleagues who are profoundly optimistic social scientists, visionaries who recognize that the alley was worth risking. Black queer New York Times columnist Lydia Polgreen would characterize these Ash colleagues as having an attachment to hope and to possibility, a commitment, op a commitment to optimism that in these somewhat strange and cynical times is likely cringe-inducing for some. But cringe be damned. Their scholarly optimism was an assurance to the rest of us that the more exciting work was beyond what was expected to be true, more than what was conventional and commonplace, more than those tired roses out front. As colleagues, we have tended to the front yard quite well, cultivated and tamed our roses out front. But a girl gets sick of a rose in the front yard, doesn't she? Let's go have some wonderful fun in the rough and untended neighbor's backyard. Let's go down the alley where we are brave and wear a neighbor's stockings of night black lace. Let's be imaginative, let's be brave. Let's play with the psychologists, philosophers, economists, anthropologists, historians, political scientists, and other scholarly neighbors, dare I say, the humanities. To extend and animate the geography of higher education research and scholarship, let's discover the new geographies of social science research that can lay bare our purposes, practices, and politics. It demands, it demands that from us now and maybe tomorrow. It's time to risk the chupacabra. I say it's fine. Honest, I do. Gracias. Please welcome to the stage, ASH 2023 Conference Accessibility Committee co-chairs, Drs. Kat Stevens-Peace and Julia Rose Karpich. Good morning, everyone, and thank you to President Martinez Aleman for your beautiful address 
and the many ways you have elevated the work of ASHA's Accessibility Committee throughout your presidency. My name is Dr. Julia Rose Karpich. My pronouns are she, her. I'm a mixed race black woman with light brown skin and dark brown curly hair that is now and always up in a bun. I'm wearing a black outfit. And I'm honored to represent ASHA's Accessibility Committee alongside Dr. Kat Stevens Peace. As we prepare to transition into the conference, I invite us to pause and reflect on how transformative and sustaining it is to connect with each other and how our ability to access one another enables and accelerates the work of building knowledge. I want to recognize the technologies, labor, and practices of access that facilitate our participation in this space as disabled and non-disabled scholars. At the same time, I'm holding space for all the ways that disabled scholars at ASH know to be wary of this space, anticipating access failures, ableist norms in formal and informal conference spaces, and the weight of being left behind. I'm holding space for how disabled scholars of color in this space have experienced multiple layers of exclusion recognizing that even spaces in our field that center disability research have historically centered the experiences and politics of white disabled students and scholars. I want to express how much I miss disabled colleagues, those who I know and don't know, who have wanted to join this shared space but do not because it continues to be inaccessible. Access is a shared asset for our organization and a central principle of disability justice, which reminds us that, quote, no body or mind can be left behind. Only moving together can we accomplish the revolution we require. On behalf of the Accessibility Committee, we want to welcome disabled scholars and scholars with lived experiences of ableism to this space. We are so glad you're here. Hello again, everyone. I am Dr. Kat Stevens-Peace. My pronouns are she, her, and gal. I am an assistant professor of higher education leadership at Oakland University, and I'm one of four Accessibility Committee co-chairs. The 2023 Accessibility Committee, built on the work of the CEP Accessibility and Equity Inclusion Subcommittee, as well as the ASH Access Committee. We are a team of nine graduate students, postdocs, early career faculty, and practitioners, including four co-chairs, myself, and Drs. Daniel Blake, Emily Corrin, and Julia Rose Carpish, as well as five committee members, Dr. Cynthia Villarreal, Amanda uh, Anastasia Panagua, Dana Kanai, Dr. Sarah Young, and Jeff Banks. As a committee representing disabled scholars, that is also led by several disabled scholars, we have valued how our committee centers our own various access needs as an integral to work together. It has been a safe and generative space in a way that is rare in higher education. Our committee was charged with expanding the accessibility of the general conference. We approached this charge by sharing feedback about access measures with the association. We have also created and finalized a variety of resources to help attendees shift and grow in their thinking around access as a collective project, including an accessibility unstatement that is available online at ash.ws slash disability justice, as well as updates to the accessibility sections of the program book and presenter guide. We hope you will read these resources and use them to help co-create a more accessible conference space. As a committee, we decided to focus on collective access across all areas of conference planning pushing past the understanding that access work is done only as a series of compliance-related tasks. 
collective access work and a culture shift benefits us all and are necessary in moving towards social justice work in action, not just Siri. Please come join us at our presidential session today at 3.30 p.m. on the third floor in Minneapolis G to explore access as a collective project and how we can confront ableism through our work. We also have receptions today and Saturday morning for our scholars doing disability research, as well as for disabled scholars to connect and build community. Lastly, we would like to express our deepest gratitude to the compassionate and thoughtful leadership of the following people. Our conference leadership committee chair, Dr. Leslie Gonzalez, Ash Executive Director, Dr. Jason Gilvo, President Martinez Alerman, as well as the scholars joining our committee to lend their time, expertise, and voices to our presidential session. Dr. Lisa Ramirez Stapleton, Dr. Edlyn Pena, and Dr. Ezekiel Kimball. We want to thank our accessibility committee members for all of their deeply meaningful contributions, and I want to thank my three fellow accessibility coaches again, Dr. Blake, Dr. Carpich, and Dr. Corin. We look forward to connecting and have a great ash.